Good morning, everyone. Good to be back for coming to the close of the semester. Um, it's just a few more weeks to go. Hope you're all doing well and keeping up with all your assignments and uh, one of the end of semester work. Before we begin, would someone be willing to open us in prayer? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to honor the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the class we are about to have. We bless uh, Ms. Smitha in the name of Jesus. And God, uh, I give all my classmates in their hands as uh, uh, our mom is teaching us, help us to open our mind and heart and listen to it and understand uh, the truth of your words, Jesus, which is the way to life which is something that we have to hold on, that we have to stick together in our heart, Jesus. Let every word uh, that is inspired by the Holy Spirit help us to treasure it in our hearts, Jesus, not just listening to it, but treasure it in our hearts so that in our walk of life, uh, we will prioritize your word, we will prioritize your kingdom, and we will live for your glory, Jesus. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. So, uh, were you all able to watch those two videos that I had posted? The uh, second Corinthians uh, 1 and 2, and then the end of first Corinthians as well. Mm -hmm. Just put the thumbs up, go Just let me know if you were able to watch it. Um, also, if you had any trouble finding it, it was on Google Classroom. Okay, if you haven't yet watched it, um, it's especially that I mean, both of those uh recordings because the first one is the end of first Corinthians, kind of concludes everything that we were talking about in first Corinthians, and the uh, uh, second video is an introduction to what we are doing. Uh, what we've continued to do since last week uh, in second Corinthians. So uh, it's important to have that context provided so that um, as we're looking at the rest of the episode, you're able to understand what Paul is talking about, why he's mentioning certain things. Um, so I encourage you to just try and go back and watch those two videos. Uh, also, is there any questions on assignments, anything? Um, have you all started working on the final assignment? Are you all having any challenges? Okay. Um, I did see some people who had emailed me and I responded um, to those emails. But if you have any questions, uh, yes, Abu uh, Bakr, you can uh, unmute and speak. And if I pronounced your name wrong, please correct me. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Please, my that assignment is not clear to me. I don't so know final assignment, is it? It's not clear, ma'am. So I try okay. to read it, read it, and read it again, but it's not clear to me. Okay. Uh, just, uh, just I, one minute. I need more light. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm not able to hear you very clearly. Uh, just one moment. Hello. Uh, hi, sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, so you said the final assignment is not very clear? Uh, are you able to hear me? Uh, Abu Bakr, if you 
had uh, could, could you just repeat your question because I wasn't able to hear very clearly. Was it the final assignment you said was not clear? Your your voice is not clear here. I can't hear you clearly, ma'am. Okay, okay. I was just asking. Uh, you you had said the final assignment question was not very clear. Is that right? Yes. Okay, okay. We'll just go over that uh, question. You said we should take one per topic and explain and relate, and relate it to other verses. I don't know, maybe we are going to take all the topics from the first Corinthians or from the second Corinthians. So that is yes. the problem I am having. Uh, yeah, so you can pick a topic either from First Corinthians or Second Corinthians, so one of those books. So, for example, if you choose the topic of unity uh, in First Corinthians, so where Paul is addressing the issue of division in the church, uh, then you look at everything that he talks about with regard to unity. Uh, you look at that specific uh, theme of unity, where all does he mention it in First Corinthians? So look at all of the different, uh, read through the whole book and pick up all the different places where unity is the theme that he's talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of summarize that. So say First Corinthians uh, in, uh, verse, in, the, in verses 5. I'm just giving an example. I'm not giving the right references, sorry. Uh, so say 5 to verse 12, uh, Paul talks about uh, unity here. And then again, in chapter 3, he talks about unity. And then in chapter 7, he talks about unity. So you mention all of those. And what does he say about unity in each of those instances? Um, and then we look at also, um, so I've asked you to look at what was the context. So there was division in the church, right? So what was the division over? And how is Paul addressing that division through this when he's talking about unity then look about uh, look at the original language meaning when he is talking about unity what does that word actually mean in greek uh, is it the same way we understand unity in uh, the english language um, then look at what kinds of words does he use specifically when he's talking about unity uh, is he talking about fellowship is he talking about communion is he talking about um, or looking at one another, uh, the way Christ views us, what kinds of things does he uh, talk about when he's talking about unity? And then uh, you look at also in the rest of scripture outside of 1 Corinthians, uh, what does the rest of scripture say about unity? Um, now for that last part, I've said you can do some research online, so search online and Look at where all are their references to unity in the uh, in the rest of scripture, and bring that into your final. Um, so your final summary should be: this is um, this is First Corinthians teaching on unity, and uh, bring in also what the rest of scripture kind of uh, says about unity. Uh, so your summary should be: this is kind of the overall teaching on unity in scripture. Um, but your most uh, your focus mostly will be on first Corinthians. You're just adding in the rest of scripture to give it a more complete kind of picture. I hope that's clear. Any questions? Yes, that's clear. Okay. Uh, anybody else had any questions? Any challenges? So it is um, a good amount of work, this paper. So um, start working on it as soon as possible so that as you have, if you have questions, um, then I can also um, be of some assistance to you as you're working on it. Okay, let's uh, go into a quick, we'll just look at uh, some of what we covered Okay, uh, Brother Lubega has asked, is there any word limit? Uh, I haven't given you a word limit for this paper because it may depend on your topic that you've chosen. 
Um, so I'm leaving that open. Um, but I do, so my main, uh, I've mentioned some of the main things that I'm looking at in this paper when I'm reading you. Um, so it is, um, just at the end there, uh, it, I want to see that you've done your own work. So you should have read through First Corinthians or Second Corinthians and done that research. I don't want to uh, just have something copied and pasted from uh, outside sources. Um, and then the second thing is how you've presented that. Uh, if you uh, checked your grammar, checked spellings, all of those things, uh, submitting on time, submitting your uh, assignment on time, and accuracy, so answering the question thoroughly. So I've given you clearly all the steps uh, for the assignment, that you're looking at it in uh, the whole of that book, and then in scripture as well. Um, so I want that is most important, that you've done that thoroughly. Um, if you've not done that, that's when you'll, then that will lead to some deduction in uh, your final score. Uh, so that's why I've not mentioned a word limit. I'm more concerned about you doing the research uh, thoroughly. So you won't get more marks if you do a long paper or less if you do a short paper. Uh, it's more about have you answered it fully, answered the question fully. Um, yeah. So, are we good on the assignment? Any other questions? Okay, we'll, um, okay, you're welcome. So uh, if you have any other questions, please feel free to email me and uh, or post on Google Classroom. Even uh, maybe someone else from the class may have an answer to your question. So uh, feel free to do that. Um, so we look at a quick uh, recap of what we did last week. Um, so from chapter three, uh, we started at chapter three last week. Uh, so in chapters one and two, uh, Paul kind of um, talks a little bit about uh, his travels, um, what he had been doing after he wrote the first letter to the Corinthians. He talks a little bit about his second missionary journey, uh, and he talks about wanting to have visited the Corinthians, and he actually does visit the Corinthians. But, uh, and why I'm mentioning this is because we'll go back to that in today's uh, class. Um, so he does visit the Corinthian church because um, there are some issues that have come up, and he wants to go there in person and address it. Uh, but during that time when he visits them, uh, that visit turns out to be quite um, uh, an unhappy one. And so he had originally planned to go back to uh, Corinth and visit the church, but instead of going back, he sends Titus with uh, a letter to the church, um, kind of to explain some of the things that he had brought up with them and why he had brought them up. Um, and so the first two chapters are mostly talking about that, about the issue uh, that was addressed, about um, why he didn't visit them, uh, when he said he would visit them on his way back from Macedonia. And uh, just some of that, uh, some of the challenges or the uh, misunderstandings that had arisen from all of that about his change of plans of visiting. Um, and some people who uh, wondered whether his word could be trusted. Uh, so those are some of the things he talks about in chapters one and two. Um, in chapter three, he uh, kind of um, goes into this support of who he is as, uh, as an apostle, as someone who planted this church and uh, took the gospel to the Corinthians. Um, now, some of this is in support of what he's talked about in chapters 1 and 2. So in 1 and 2, people were questioning whether his word can be trusted. Uh, he had brought up uh, some he had confronted them with certain issues, and uh, that had brought up 
had had brought up this kind of misunderstanding you know, or their relationship was a little bit um not not fully reconciled to one another and so he is supporting who he is as their leader he's uh, writing to just remind them that you know, of his heart for them uh, as uh, someone who planted this church and um, he's also writing uh, because there were certain uh, other people who were trying to come into the church and take over uh, and kind of say that they were uh, better leaders or uh, superior to Paul. And so he's supporting himself, uh, taking into consideration both these uh, situations, the situation with the church as well as um, opponents that are coming in and uh, questioning his authority within the church and kind of trying to draw some people in the church away with them. Uh, so uh, that's what we look at in uh, chapter three is um, talking uh, about his role in bringing uh, this glorious new covenant uh, that God had entrusted that covenant to him and he had brought it to the uh, Corinthian church uh, and it focuses a lot on the glory of this new covenant uh, and um, what a powerful covenant it is in comparison to the old covenant that was given through Moses. Uh, in chapter 4, um, he uh, talks about more on the gospel, uh, how he as a minister of God uh, has carried the gospel to them, uh, how he has suffered uh, as part of that role of being an apostle. Uh, so not only has he taken this glorious gospel, but it has also required sacrifice. It has required a lot of suffering as well. Um, and, and so in seeing that suffering, uh, he's encouraging uh, the Corinthian church to know that his work was with uh, genuine love for them uh, and uh, full commitment to Christ, to see Christ honored. Uh, so those are the two things uh, we looked at last week of uh, throughout their ministry, their focus is on the church, the church being benefited and Christ being glorified. So with that, we come um, to chapter five. Uh, we continue from chapter 5, verse uh, 16 onwards. We stopped at verse 15. We look from 16 onwards. If someone can read for us um, chapter 16, uh, I mean, chapter 5, verse 16, and we'll go till verse 21. Uh, five chapter uh, chapter five verses sixteen till the end of the chapter. Second Corinthians chapter five verses sixteen. So from now on, we regard no one from a human point of view. Though we have known Christ from a human point of view, now we no longer know him in this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. The whole new things have come. Awakening right brings a new life. But all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. 
So we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making his affinity through us. We plead with you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. He made Christ who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that in him we would become the righteousness of God. That is, we would be acceptable to him and placed in a right relationship with him by his gracious loving kindness. So, um, so here we see in uh, chapter 5, that first section, uh, Paul was talking about how we are living for an eternal purpose. So we don't, uh, we're, we're not concerned about what is happening in an earthly realm, how we're being judged in an earthly realm. Uh, what we are concerned about is uh, what Christ will say when we stand before him. And so we live uh, our lives on earth uh, very focused on that judgment uh, that will happen when we stand before Christ. And then uh, he uh, goes into this second section of the chapter. And uh, here he says, um, it is the love of Christ. So verse 14, it's the love of Christ that compels us uh, because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So uh, basically here he's saying, uh, this is what pushes us to do everything that we're doing. It is uh, Christ's love that was displayed in his death on the cross. And so because he died, he set an example that we should be willing to die uh, for his sake. Uh, and we should no longer live for ourselves, but live for him. Um, and so this is the new life that we live in Christ. Uh, we live a life where uh, everything about the way we look at the world, the way we uh, look at why we are living, what is our purpose, uh, what are our goals, everything is transformed uh, in this new life. The, we look at eternity, uh, the perspective with which we look at life here on earth is from this eternal perspective. Uh, and the reason we live is for the purposes of Christ. Uh, and so verses 16 to 21 is taken in that context. So from now on, um, so in uh, the NKJV it says, therefore from now on. So based on this new life that we have in Christ, because we are in Christ, we no longer live according to the flesh. We no longer uh, regard people. So we no longer view people uh, or uh, view you specifically as a church uh, in the way we view, we would have viewed you before we knew Christ. Uh, we have a new perspective and we view you uh, through the eyes of Christ, uh, with Christ's goals for you, with Christ's purposes for you. And everything we do is from that perspective and from that heart, uh, that love that Christ has uh, for you. And so why he's saying this is to continue to uh, continue to affirm that everything that he did, everything that he said, uh, the correction, uh, the rebuke uh, that he gave them um, was coming from this place of love. Uh, from a true, genuine heart uh, for Christ and for the church. Um, so, uh, so a few things here that he talks about is uh, because of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, how he looks at people and how he relates to God, both those things have changed. Right? So he says uh, in verse 17, uh, or verse 16, um, even though we knew Christ according to flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. We know Christ himself in a new way. Uh, we have a spiritual revelation about who Christ is that we didn't have before we were saved. Uh, so before we were saved, we knew Christ in our uh, in our just in our flesh, basically, uh, without uh, a full um, spiritual revelation.
question of who Christ is. Um, and then in verse 17, in if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. So the way uh, we live life, the way we view what we're doing, everything is transformed uh, in Christ. Uh, we have this uh, experience of being born again uh, in the spirit. And uh, in the spirit, we come alive to the things of God. And we've been made uh, people who are completely new. Uh, as Romans 6 talks about, that old sinful nature is taken away. And uh, we are living a new life in the spirit. So uh, all this is to say that um, that Paul and uh, Titus and those who are serving the church are doing everything in, in the spirit. They are doing things with this heart of purity, with uh, a true compassion for the people. Um, and as he said before, he knows that he will stand before Christ at the end. And so uh, if he's doing something with impure motives or with the wrong, uh, wrong uh, motivation or wrong uh, thought towards the church, then Christ himself will judge him at the end. Um, and then from verse 18 onwards, they start to talk about this uh, ministry of reconciliation that has been given uh, to him and uh, to, uh, to all of us as believers, as people who are, are sent on behalf of Christ to the world. Uh, now, why he's talking about this again, is he's calling the people to be reconciled to him and to be reconciled to Christ. Because if Paul is a representative of Christ, Christ has sent Paul as an ambassador. If the people are not reconciled to Christ's ambassador, they can't be reconciled to Christ. So Christ has given Paul this message of reconciliation. Uh, and that message is from Christ himself. Right? If they are unwilling to accept it, then they are, in a sense, unwilling to accept Christ himself. Uh, so that is the role of an ambassador. An ambassador, um, uh, we see even uh, when Jesus is sending out the disciples, he says, if people reject you, they are actually not rejecting you, they are rejecting me. Right? And he sends out the disciples uh, with, the, uh, with the message of the kingdom. And so this is what Paul is saying as well that uh that he's calling them to reconciliation to christ but to be reconciled to christ also be reconciled to him uh, and he'll continue to talk about that in the next chapter um so he says now all things are of god who has reconciled us to himself through jesus christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation so um Jesus himself has brought us back to relationship with the Father, to right standing before the Father. And uh, so that ministry of reconciliation, to call people back to relationship with the Father, uh, has been given to us. Um, and then in verse 19, that God was in Christ reconciling the word, world to himself. Uh, so that is that ministry that they have, that... Uh, God himself uh, was reconciling people to himself through Christ and uh, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So uh, to through Christ for our sins to be removed, our sins not to be counted against us, uh, that was the message that they took to the church. In verse 20, now then we as ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Uh, so what is an ambassador? Does anyone want to answer? Who is an ambassador or what is the role of an ambassador? <laughs> Sorry. No, just think like when people say ambassador, I just think like it's maybe something big and big. <laughs> That's all that I know. So Jeffina shared that um, that word ambassador 
kind of uh, represents something that is a big or a great uh, responsibility, a great um, role to play, a position uh, that is given to someone. Anyone else? What is your understanding of our role as ambassadors? Representatives. Yeah, representatives. Uh, so going on behalf of someone. Uh, so we are being sent to uh, stand as that person would stand before uh, before other people. Okay. So um, I'll just add uh, a little more. So ambassador is a very um, it's a it's like a government position right so it's a diplomatic position where a ruler or someone in authority sends somebody um, to go on their behalf and to share a message with uh, certain other people um, and that message that that person shares has the authority of the person who has sent them uh, and should be received with that same amount of fear you would give the person in authority. You receive it from the ambassador. Now, typically, uh, in especially in the Old Testament, the prophet was seen as this person who had a message from God uh, and was the representative of God to the people. Um, in more diplomatic terms, uh, and a lot of how it's used in the Old Testament is um, where uh, the when the prophet was speaking, God was like um, a ruler over those people, like a, a ruling king had taken over a smaller uh, a smaller country, say, and that country had a smaller king. So the ruling king coming to the smaller king, sharing, uh, sending an ambassador to share a message with the uh, the king who is serving him. Okay, so there's a lot of authority in that position as an ambassador. Um, you are representing someone who is very, very important and powerful. The message you have is very important and is feared by the subordinate because uh, that person will be if affected uh, mightily by what is being shared by that message that is being shared so especially uh, in the old testament where we see uh, words of uh, rebuke exhortation correction calling people back uh, and then giving them consequences if you don't come back this is what will happen. This is what will happen. Uh, just imagine that coming from a ruling king and you are a subordinate king. You know that that ruling king has power over you um, and he has sent this message of warning to you. It's something to be really uh, feared and something to be really taken with a lot of gravity. Um, so this is that's the kind of language that Paul is using. So when he's talking about being an ambassador, he is coming from the ruler, the ruler, uh, the one true God, he is the spokesperson for that that uh, God, for Christ, who is seated on the throne, uh, before whom all angels, uh, all authorities, uh, all powers in heaven and on earth bow before. And he is standing there speaking a message from that ruler. Uh, so just the gravity of that message uh, should be understood, right? And so he's saying, we are pleading on behalf of God. Uh, why should this God plead with us, right? He is all powerful, almighty. There is absolutely no reason he should come to us with that kind of humility. But, uh, but uh, Paul and... Christ Himself uh, come with humility to uh, to us, and Paul presents that message of we are we are pleading with you, we are imploring you, we are like we are begging you, we are calling you back 
to Christ, to be reconciled to God. Because when you come to Christ, uh, you're coming back to God himself. Um, so yeah, just to understand the humility, the kindness of God uh, towards us, when we recognize both his power, but as well as that uh, gentleness or the the mercy that he has when he's calling us back to himself. And then verse 21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Um, so we understand here what exactly it was that reconciled us to God. Uh, Jesus himself uh, was God in the flesh, was sinless, uh, but he became sin. He carried the sin of the world on himself to the extent that uh, he represented sin itself. For someone who was absolutely pure and holy and without sin, to be equated with sin is, is uh, something that is so contrary to what we can imagine uh, and what God is himself. Uh, but in doing this, uh, it was so that we could have that state that Jesus himself was in. We would be that righteousness of God. Uh, not that we would be made righteous, but we would be God's righteousness itself. Um, and there's a quote here from Spurgeon that says, what a grand expression. He makes us righteous through the righteousness of Jesus. Nay, not only makes us righteous, but righteousness. Nay, that is not all. He makes us the righteousness of God. That is higher than the righteousness of Adam in the garden. It is more divinely perfect than angelic perfection. Um, so, yeah, just uh, for us to understand, we have been made God's righteousness uh, because of what Jesus did for us. Um, so what does it mean to be made God's righteousness? To be blameless, to be not Anything else to be made God's righteousness? To be in right standing with God. Yes. Thank you. So, um, I just want to say that when we say uh, God the righteousness, I think as Muslims said, it gives that right standing to God. It, there's a verse that says, now we stand boldly calling him uh, Abba Father. We can go to the throne. Uh, so that's the privilege that the righteousness of God has given us, even though we serve it. And sometimes we are we are sinful and uh, it's, it's the blood of Jesus that covers his clean face. And I think that's basically what that, as Paul says about reconciliation here, we can go to the throne which one thing that comes to my mind. Yeah, so uh, the privilege of being uh, made righteous is to be able to stand before God. Um, God's righteousness is perfect, right? It's the perfect will of God. It's the uh, perfect uh, purposes of God. All that God desires for the way the world should be, the way things should be, uh, is uh, where there is perfect goodness, there is perfect, uh, there is no evil, there is no sin, there is uh, no darkness, there is no sickness, there is no disease, uh, there is no death. And that is the righteousness of God, where we, uh, we become that perfect will of God. Uh, what we were uh, truly meant to be in in God's eyes when he created us. Um, and that is because of what Christ has done for us. So just as Christ is before the Father, uh, is what we are before the Father. 
uh, just imagine that. So Christ was sinless and sent to the earth to become sin for us so that we could be as Christ is before the Father. Um, to be those children of God, uh, to be perfect, to be blameless, to be holy, to be um, fully, uh, fully an expression of who God is. Um, and so uh, with that, Paul uh, goes into the next part of his letter. Um, Let's see how much of this we can read before we go for a break. So chapter 6. Okay, let's just read verses 1 and 2. We'll uh, look at that and then we'll come back and look at the rest of the chapters. Someone can read chapter, uh, verse 1 and 2, chapter 6. We then, Second. as workers together with him, also plead with you, not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day, the day of salvation. So here in chapter 6, we see uh, another, so uh, in chapter 5, Paul says we are ambassadors, and now he says we are co-workers. So this work that we are doing, uh, imagine that that we have now been we're raised to the level of working side by side with this uh, God who is all-powerful, uh, this almighty God. Uh, and so in this place of authority that we have, uh, we want you not to uh, take for granted this grace you've received, right? So verse uh, chapter 5 beautifully uh, describes what that grace is for, uh, for the church uh, to be uh, made right with God. And so don't, don't throw this away as worthless or don't let it be something you receive but that has no effect on you. Uh, instead, let it have its full uh, effect on the way you live, uh, on the way you respond to that grace. Um, so this he's saying uh, to the church, but it's a message also for us uh, that when we receive this grace, uh, what, how do we respond to it? Um, now in 1 Corinthians 15.10, Paul talks about uh, the grace he received, right? So he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, that is, than the rest of the apostles. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Um, so Paul is talking about how he worked um, he worked so hard because he knew the grace he had received, uh, not only to be saved by Christ, but to be saved as someone who was persecuting the church before that. And so he worked harder than the rest of the apostles because he felt that the grace he received was greater uh, because, of, because of what he had been doing before he met Christ. Um, so similarly to recognize uh, that that we have received such great grace. And so our response to that grace should be equally, uh, should uh, should reflect what, uh, what we've received, right? Our gratitude towards what we've received, the kinds of sacrifice that we make, the commitment that we make to Christ, uh, the things we are willing to do for Christ. Um, so uh, we see that in Paul's life, the suffering that he went through, uh, the, uh, the ways in which he did much more than the rest of the apostles, whether it was in terms of uh, going around the world with the gospel, uh, in terms of facing persecution, uh, in terms of working to support himself in ministry, all of those things uh, were sacrifices that he made because, of, because he recognized the grace he had received. Um, so uh, just an encouragement for us as well in our 
walk with the Lord, what kinds of sacrifices are we making? Uh, how are we acknowledging God's grace uh, that he has given us? And then in our ministries, how are we uh, making the same kinds of sacrifices that we see Christ made for us? Uh, how are we reflecting that in our ministries? Um, so in this verse 2, I, I think we can come back and look at that. Uh, we look at Isaiah 14, 9, if someone can be ready to read that for us when we come back. Uh, we'll take a break. Thank you. 